I can see 285 people wow. uh, <laughs> in the, waiting, waiting in front of the screen. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, now that uh, all of you are in our webinar room, good evening, good afternoon, good morning, depending from where you are dialing in. Welcome to our video conference. My name is Matthias Weller from the University of Bonn, and it is my great pleasure and honor to moderate our event together with my co-moderator, Alfred Fass, who represents our esteemed co-host, the Center for Research on Dutch Jewelry at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. We received hundreds of registrations from all over the world for this event. Such a huge response shows us once more that there is still much to be done. If there is a way for striving towards justice after the Holocaust, it includes speaking with each other. And I am particularly grateful that so many people who suffered from the Holocaust decided to participate in our event, an event that after all is organized from an institution located in Germany, and it is Germany that has to take the historical responsibility for the Holocaust. Thank you for being here and for talking with us tonight. For the same reason, I am particularly grateful to our co-host, the center. And this is the moment where I would like to pass over to you, Alfred. Thank you, Matthias. It's my distinct pleasure to welcome tonight, first of all, the claimants who joined us. In the end of the day, it's about their rights. We are also honored to welcome all the government officials, com committee members, museum officials who are with us. Many, many academics, university faculty members, and especially the provenance researchers, lawyers, and media representatives. Last, but really not least, we welcome Mr. Jacob Konstam, Chairman, and Mr. Rob Polak, Member of the Committee for the Evaluation of the Restitution Policy for Cultural Heritage, Heritage Object from the Second World War, which we all know as under the Konstam Committee. The co-host of tonight, is the Center for Research on the History of Dutch Jewelry at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. We're very proud to be here tonight. The center was founded 53 years ago by my good friend, the late Dr. Joseph Michman Melman. The center owns the major Dutch Jewish library in Israel on Mount Scopus in Jerusalem and is in possession of some of the most precious archives. We organize every six year an international symposium on Dutch jewelry and have published all their proceedings. Back to you, Matthias. Thank you, Alfred. And uh, special welcomes to our distinguished speakers and attendees from all sides from my part as well. The first part of our talk is an introduction and it is uh, my pleasure and privilege to deliver this introduction together with one of our team members here at the University of Bonn, Tessa Scheller. Tessa, thank you very much for being with us tonight. Many of you know that our team here is working on the research project financed by the federal government of Germany. And this project is in the process of establishing a, resti a, res a restatement of restitution rules for Nazi confiscated art. What does that mean? We are looking at the restitution practice as it has developed since the Washington Principles. And from the many decisions and recommendations on restitution cases, and we have collected almost 1,000 of such cases in our database space, and of course we are going on. We distill guiding rules and principles that describe and represent this practice. This is a technique well known from the US American restatements of the law 
by the highly esteemed American Law Institute. Such restatements help us to better understand what exactly is going on and what are underlying policies, arguments, rules, assessment frameworks, and where and why are there points of controversy or inconsistency. Such a restatement does not produce binding rules. Our research is designed for enabling and facilitating comparison, evaluation, standardization if wanted, and further development of the practice in our issues. We are doing our research from a comparative perspective. Mm -hmm. We look at the practice in five countries of the 44 states that subscribed to the Washington principles. These countries are next to the Netherlands, Germany, Austria, France, and the United Kingdom. Why these five countries? Because these five established a commission like the Dutch Restitutions Commission. All other of the 44 states do not have such a commission despite the recommendation in numbers 10 and 11 of the Washington principles. It is this international context we are interested in and we now would like to set the stage, so to speak, for our keynote speakers. From this international perspective, we will provide some insights uh, uh, of our research that might help us putting into context what we will hear about the Kornstam report in short time. We will address three points that relate to core issues in the Kornstam report. First, the weighing of interests. Second, the role of good faith acquisitions after the war. And third, the status of special collections such as the NK collection. I will begin with the first one of these aspects and then Tessa will take over. From a theoretical viewpoint, weighing of interests is inherent to justice. Since Aristotle and maybe even longer in the past, it is generally accepted that justice has to do with equality, treat like cases alike, and proportionality. Proportionality requires putting interests involved into a proportion. Number eight of the Washington Principles takes this up and tells us that just and fair solutions may require, and I quote from the well-known wording, recognizing this may vary according to the facts and circumstances surrounding the specific case, end of quote. Stuart Eisenstadt explained on this very point, and I quote from the Washington Conference materials of 1998, after existing artworks have been matched with documented losses, comes the delicate process of reconciling competing equities of ownership to produce a just and fair solution, the subject of the eighth and ninth principle." End of quote. Reconciling competing equities of ownership is a weighing of conflicting interests. So it seems to me that the point cannot be whether or not there is a weighing of interests. There always is once we embark on decisions about justice. Rather, the point must be, how do we do it? Our comparative research shows us that some commissions do it openly, others do it implicitly, some do it sometimes and sometimes not, and some do not do it themselves because their assessment framework has done it for them. For example, in Germany, the government laid down some very rudimentary rules for handling claims the so-called Handreichung, the manual of the government to handle claims. This document provides for a quite strict framework in favor of claimants without any balancing of interests and nothing is said about considering the importance of the object to the museum. However, the German Commission in its second last 
or latest recommendation of the 2nd July of 2020 in the case of Karl Hagen explicitly embarked on a weighing of interests and it included in its considerations the fact that the artwork in question was of little importance to the museum. In this case, this worked in favor of the claimants so and the commission resulted in recommending restitution on the basis of this balancing of interests. Without the balancing of this interest and other interests involved in that case, the case would have been lost for the claimants. But of course, we are now asking ourselves, what is the German commission going to do if in a future case, the artwork in question is of central relevance to the museum? The German Commission had expressly embarked on a balancing of interests once more before. And this was in its recommendation of 2016 in the case of Felix Hildesheimer and the claim against the Hagemann Foundation about the Guarneri violin, the case that is currently going through the media, but not at all for the method that the German Commission had apply applied the balancing of interests but for the lack of compliance with the recommendation on the part of the foundation afterwards. I'm sure we will come back to this case later in the discussion. And also Tessa will come back to the recommendation in this case as it also relates to the issue of good faith. And yesterday, as many of you will have noticed, the German Commission published its latest recommendation in the case of a painting by Erich Heckel that once belonged to the collection of Max Fischer and is currently held at the Kunsthalle Karlsruhe. In this case, the Commission could very well have and perhaps should have embarked on a way of interests, in particular in light of the recommendations I just cited, it would have been in a way consistent to go into a weighing of interest in light of these other two cases, but that was not done, even though there is an issue of good faith acquisition in this case as well, but that was not addressed at all by the commission. Rather, the commission strictly applied the presumption of a forced sale in favor of the claimants and thereby resulted in recommending restitution. Irrespective of the results in the particular case at hand, what we observe is a lack of predictability and lingering concerns about what exactly are the standards for evaluating a claim. They seem to change from case to case. This is a difficult way towards justice in my view. I firmly believe that methodically speaking, in the longer run, the Dutch way is the more promising one for all of us. And this is spelling out an assessment framework as clear and as unambiguous as possible, discussing it like we do it tonight. And of course, we do hope in the longer run that our restatement, once it is on the table, will contribute establishing such assessment frameworks where they are still missing and to further reflect on those that are already in place. With these points made, uh, I hand over to you, Tessa, on the issue of good faith. Thank you. Thank you, Matthias. My first uh, observation on the matter of good faith acquisition of title is the following. There are very different approaches in the legal systems. As a matter of tradition, continental European legal orders tend towards allowing bona fide purchase under certain conditions. And these conditions also vary from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Whereas common law jurisdictions tend to reject good faith acquisition as such, but usually provide for exclusions of claims by original owners based on equity considerations. The Washington principles want us to go beyond the law and approach our matter from a moral perspective. So how do the five commissions handle cases when it comes to good faith? 
In Germany, good faith acquisition is no factor against a claim if we look at the government's guidelines in the Handreichung. Nevertheless, it plays a role in practice. For example, in its recommendation of 2016 to the Hagemann Foundation about the Guarneri violin, the violin that originally belonged to Felix Hildesheimer's business. The commission held that restitution would not appear as a just and fair solution given the good faith acquisition of the violin by Sophie Hagemann, a private person in 1974. However, the Hagemann Foundation was advised to pay compensation and the sum of compensation was determined amongst other factors with a view to costs of restoration incurred by the foundation. Unfortunately, the foundation has not yet implemented this recommendation. And I'm sure as many of you has followed the me have followed the media, the commission has criticized this in a press release whereupon the foundation answered by issuing its own press release. It's not my task here to evaluate uh, this latest development and we're really happy to come back to this uh, in the discussion. But my point here is to demonstrate that a good faith acquisition is a relevant factor that was taken into account in the recommendation in 2016. To underline this, I quote the recommendation of the German Commission, which states, it should be recognized in the present case that the violin was acquired in good faith. And this was done with a weighing of interest. So let me quote once more. Under these circumstances, the commission believes that the fair and just solution desired by both sides consists in a balance of interests." End of quote. These circumstances not only included the good faith acquisition of the violin by a private individual in 1974, but also the fact that the foundation had instituted proactively the provenance research and had proactively reached out for the heirs and had approached the commission for its recommendation. It seems to me that the kind of mediatory solution the German commission developed in this case is quite in line with what is proposed in the Konstam report. But we will hear about this in more detail later. So let's have a look at the other countries. In Austria, the legislative materials to the restitution law make expressly clear that even in the event of a good faith acquisition of a museum after the war, there will be restitution if the object was involuntarily lost and this is also implemented in practice. In France, good faith in acquisitions is irrelevant, be it under the compensation schemes implementing the Washington principles, be it under the applicable law. This means that you can go to civil courts today and claim back your property from any possessor, including private persons, even if the object went through a number of hands in good faith after the war. Turning lastly to the UK, Section 16 of the Commission's Terms of Reference explains that the panel shall take into account the circumstances of the acquisition of the object and its knowledge at that time of the object's provenance. And this is also implemented in practice. So it seems to me that the Kohnstam report is somewhere in between, but as I said, we will hear more about this in a few moments. Now I would like to discuss briefly the status of the special collections like the NK collection. The NK collection in the Netherlands contains cultural goods taken from their pre-war owners during the time of the NS regime, saved by the Allied forces in Germany and transferred back to the Dutch government in order to give them back to the rightful owners. The Kornstam report tells us, and I quote, with the passage of time, the state has become legal owner. In France, the equivalent to the NCAR collection is the MNR collection. French law uses the term garde for this collection, which indicates a type of custody of the object on behalf of the rightful owner. The state does not consider itself as the owner and a special regime applies. The courts in France do not allow the argument of passage of time. In Germany, 
there's a remaining stock of the central collecting points held by the government, the so-called Restbestand CCP. Sometimes these remainders are compared to the works of the NCAR and MNR collection, and often the view is also taken that the German state is the owner of these works. In our view, we need to distinguish. The German state is the owner of the works that originated from the former property of the German Reich. However, for the parts of the collections that were recovered by the Allies, the German state should be seen as the custodian rather than as the owner. In any case, the objects in this special collection are not subject to a special assessment framework. Rather, the rules for restitution are the same as for artworks acquired by museums after the war. This general assessment framework works quite strongly in favor of the claimants. The central part of it is a presumption of a forced sale, and this presumption can hardly ever be rebutted in case of sales after September 1935. Certain exclusions of the claim are put in place. For example, if there had already been a compensation before. No comparable sets of special collections exist anymore in Austria or have ever existed in the UK. Given this comparative assessment, it is interesting that the Kohnstamm report stresses that the Dutch state is the legal owner of the NCAR collection. At the end of the day, however, it matters how the holder, be it the owner, be it the custodian, deals with these objects. And sometimes an owner who takes this moral obligation seriously might even be better placed to take final decisions than a custodian. There's of course a symbolic dimension in this question as well. Yeah, with these points made, I would like to give back to you, Matthias. Thank you very much for this, Tessa. I, I think we realized uh, once more from your input that a lot of light is shed on our matters from a comparative perspective. Part of this comparative perspective is of course a close look and a deep understanding of the respective national approaches. And today we are of course mainly focusing on the Netherlands. I'm very much looking forward to listening to our keynote speakers and I hand over to you, Alfred, for welcoming and introducing them for us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthias. It's my great pleasure and privilege to introduce Jacob Kornstam and Rob Polak. Um, Rob Polak will give a short introduction on the manner in which the Kornstam Committee dealt with the balancing of interest test. Rob is one of the most experienced Dutch lawyers specialized in institution law and has handled many prominent cases for claimants as well as for museum, like the Houtsticker case and the Semmel case. He is at present the chair of the ethical committee of the organization of Dutch Musea. Jacob has had many public functions in the last 25 years. He has been a member of Dutch parliament in both chambers Tweede Kamer and Eerste Kamer, Senate, Chairman of the Party, and a Minister in the Dutch Government. The personal word. I got to know Jacob at my hearing before the Advisory Commission last year. I was asked to appear as a claimant and heir, heir of the Adelsberg Collection, as well as a representative of the Center for Research of Dutch Germany. Frankly speaking, Jacob impressed me profoundly by his emphatic and informal approach. Thank you for this. The report we all read is a turning point in the history of the Dutch restitution. We are convinced that this report puts the Netherlands again on the world stage as a torchbearer for restitution of looted art. Jacob, thank you so much for immediately and spontaneously accepting our invitation to be our keynote speaker tonight. The floor is yours. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me uh, to be a speaker today. Um, ladies and gentlemen, good evening, good morning, uh, good whatever you are. Last year, as 
uh, you know, I had the honor of chairing the committee that evaluated the Netherlands restitution policy. Back in 2016, it was decided that this evaluation would take place in 2020, 75 years after the end of World War II. During the interviews we concluded, conducted last year, we discovered a widely held misconception. Many of those we spoke saw the evaluation as a response to the criticism of how the Restitutions Committee had performed its task. The committee's binding opinion on, on the restitution request for Kandinsky's Bild mit Häusern had attractive, particularly fierce criticism, both in the Netherlands and abroad. This criticism maybe underlined the importance of conducting a policy and evaluation, but it was certainly not the reason for this undertaking. The Evaluation Committee took a close look at the restitution policy in the Netherlands. This policy was established by the Dutch government in 2001 on the basis, of course, of the Washington principles and the detailed report drawn up by the Eckhart Committee, which was based on, on these principles. At the time, this policy led to the founding of the Bureau Herkomst Gezocht, the origins unknown agency, and established the establishment of the Restitutions Commission. Our assignment was to look specifically at the consequences of the policy changes that took effect in 2015 with due regard for the restitution policy that has existed since 2001. Both 2015, before 2015, the situation regarding requests for restitution was complicated by the fact that both the assessment framework for decisions to be taken and the procedure to be followed depended on who had become into possession of the objects and when. In the case of objects belonging to the so-called NK collection, balancing of interests played no part in the decision-making process. After all, this collection consists of objects brought back to the Netherlands from Germany by the Allies with the strong suspicion that they had been looted. If someone submitted a request for restitution for an object from the NK collection, the policy framework prescribed that the object should be returned to the original owner or their next of kin without further consideration, as long as the original ownership was highly plausible and the involuntary nature of the dispossession was sufficiently plausible. If the original owner was a private individual who belonged to a section of the population that was persecuted, involuntary dispossession was assumed unless there was express evidence to the contrary. Different criteria applied to objects that did not belong to the NK collection and which could be necessarily be designed as not necessarily be designed as looted artworks. Many such objects were acquired by Dutch museums during or after World War II. When assessing requests for restitution for objects in this category, balancing of interests had been permitted since 2012. But when in 2015, the Dutch government decided that balancing of interest should also apply when assessing claims for objects that were returned to the Netherlands by the Allies in custody, objects from the NK collection, this sparked a storm of protest. At this point, I would like to clarify the position taken by the Restitutions Committee itself. Despite this shift in policy, the rest of the committee explicitly refused to take any such balancing of interest into account when considering objects in, from the NK collection. In essence, this was a form of civil disobedience, but one viewed with a great deal of sympathy by the Evaluation Committee. The developments formed the basis for a key recommendation by the Evaluation Commission. 
we believe that this balancing of interest should no longer play a decisive role. In our view, such criteria can detract from the objective of making amends to the injustice done to Jewish owners in World War II. And as a result, the Evaluation Committee had drawn up a new and unambiguous assessment framework on the understanding that it should also apply to all possible requests for restitutions. And by the way, uh, Rob Polak was within the Evaluation Committee, the architect of this assessment framework. Firstly, this framework will make the policy more transparent, a much needed improvement, because for by no fewer than 15 documents drawn up over the course of 20 years, our proposal for a new assessment framework operates as a decision tree and clearly indicates the recommendation the restitution committee should give or the decision it should take in any given set of circumstances. The basis for the new assessment framework is of course provided by the Washington principles and their practical implementation in the recommendation proposed by Eckert committee at the start of the 21st century. It should be noted that the evaluation committee does not believe that this widely censured practice of balancing interest is in conflict with the literal text of the Washington Principles. After all, the eighth principle states that steps should be taken to achieve a just and fair solution, but then exactly like Matthias also quoted before, recognizing this may vary according to the facts and circumstances surrounding a specific case, words that allow for a balancing of interest. The decision tree we have advised prescribes that if original ownership and involuntary dispossession can be assumed to be high or sufficient to, uh, to a sufficient degree, then restitution should be affected, as was the case with objects from the NK collection before 2015. There's one exception, however. If the current owner acquired an object with a Nazi past that is not part of the NK collection, and did so in good faith, then we see scope for the Restitutions Committee to opt for a more intermediate solution. And by in good faith, we mean that the current owner did not know or could not reasonably have known at the time of acquisition that the object had been looted. It goes without saying that any such solution much, must serve to bring about legal redress and comply with the Washington principles, just and fair. For example, the Restitution Committee may advise or decide to retain the object subject to financial conditions or to return it on condition that it continues to be regularly exhibited to the public. However, when a municipal or state museum possessed a looted work of art under circumstances that aren't accepted due to the current standards, then we recommend that that owner should not make an appeal on the grounds that it acted in good faith. This view, by the way, is shared by the museum directors we spoke to. They told us in no uncertain terms that they have no desire to have objects tainted by the Nazis past in their collection. The Evaluation Committee concluded that Dutch restitution policy indeed violate the, the Washington principles, but in another respect. The first seven principles require countries to investigate the provenance of artworks looted by the Nazi regime and to encourage owners of their heirs to request restitution. At the start of the 21st century, the Netherlands put significant effort into these activities and achieved results. Bureau Herkomst gezocht carried out extensive research into the provenance of items in the NK collection. In cases where the agency found details of the original owners, either they or their next of kin were contacted. They were then encouraged to request restitution exactly as described in the seventh of the Washington Principles. 
and between 2008 and 2018, museums in the Netherlands also conducted thorough research into the provenance of their collections. Partly due to this provenance research, the Dutch approach was long viewed, I think, as exemplary. But this came to an end in 2007 when Bureau Herkomst gezocht discontinued these activities. Since then, they have no longer been carried out on a systematic basis. As a result, a great deal of work remains to be done. This is partly because the research done at the time was not entirely conclusive. For example, the backs of some paintings were not examined. Furthermore, the investigation was not limited to provenance from the period 40 to 45. The period 33 to 40 was not included. Since 2007, a great deal of new research material has become available, including studies of Nazi art collections. New sources, such as major archives, have also become accessible and advances in IT have vastly improved the searchability of the data available. The systematic investigation of provenance in the NK collection should be resumed and active efforts should therefore once again be made to trace heirs of the original owners. The Dutch government received the looted artworks with, from the Allies after World War II with the aim of returning them to their original owners, like Tessa already said. That responsibility therefore lies with the Dutch state. Potential heirs should not have to depend on commercial or non-commercial parties approaching them with the news that the Nazi regime stole a painting from a previous generation of their family and offer to investigate in or not in a no cure, no pay basis. In preparing our recommendations, we spoke to a number of claimants former claimants and members of the legal profession. We also conducted a survey to learn more about their experiences of the restitution policy. Apart from very positive reactions, we also received serious criticism of how the restitution policy is implemented. These focused, focused on the tendency towards litigation and the bureaucratic nature of the implementation. We have made a number of recommendations aimed at improving those aspects. One is the setting up of a help desk that takes both a responsive and proactive approach to providing information about restitution policy. As a result, applicants and potential applicants can be better informed. Another positive step would be for the restitutions committee itself to adopt a stronger focus on communication by engaging in a dialogue with the applicants and explaining the procedure more clearly. In order to achieve this, the Secretariat of the Restitutions Committee need to be expanded. Our report offers advice to the Minister of Culture. It remains to be seen whether, and if so, how she will act upon our recommendations. That process is bound to be influenced by the fact that Corona Volente, the Dutch general elections will take place mid-March. I am nevertheless hopeful that the Minister of Culture will move ahead and translate the relevant sections of our report into new policy before the next elections. One issue that the Minister will have to address is whether the new policy will apply retroactively Generally speaking, new policies apply only to the future. But since the balancing of interest has only played a role in the Restitution Committee's final decision in a very few cases to date, I can imagine that this new policy will be given retroactive effect. But this is a very much a political decision to be taken. Ladies and gentlemen, I will leave you with this thought. In light of what was inflicted on Jews under the Nazi regime, dehumanization, robbery and murder, the restoration of justice is in absolute terms a noble but maybe unachievable goal. Nevertheless, 
striving for justice must remain our guiding principle in restitution policy as in other areas. As the book of Deuteronomy says, chapter 16, verses 20, pursue justice and justice alone. Thanks for your attention and I hand over to Rob to continue on our uh, uh, exploration of the restitutions policy. policy. Rob. Thank you, Jacob, and thank you, Matthias and uh, Alfred, for the invitation to add a few words to what uh, uh, Jacob just uh, told you. Um, Jacob explained that our committee uh, recommended to let the balancing of interest test no longer play a decisive role in deciding whether or not to return an object. Um, in our report, we have discussed all the factors that are part of that balancing of interest test as reflected in the current regulation of the Restitutions Committee. Um, and although we believe that the test as such is not appropriate, uh, we do believe that some of the factors that are mentioned in that regulation may in some shape, shape or form be relevant, while others should in our view not play any role at all. Um, I will briefly discuss these factors and then discuss a question, and actually a hard question, I think. Um, the first factor, internationally and nationally accepted principles such as the Washington principles and the government's policy guidelines concerning the restitution of looted art. They are clearly relevant. I don't think a serious discussion about that is possible. Um, the second one, the second factor, the circumstances in which possession of the work was lost should in the view of the committee be dismissed as a separate factor because if it is established that the work is lost involuntarily then that's it, and no further evaluation of the precise circumstances should play a role in the decision making. If, on the other hand, involuntary dispossession is not deemed plausible, the restitution request should simply be rejected. We also believe that the third factor, the extent to which the applicant has endeavored to recover the work in the past, should not play any role. Um, the same is true for what are the fifth, the sixth, and the seventh factors, the significance of the work to the applicant, the sig significance of the work to the current possessor, and the significance of the work to public art collections. We think these factors should not play a role. However, there's one factor that we, after a lot of discussion, think is relevant, and that is the fourth factor, the circumstances in which the current possessor acquired the work and the inquiries the current possessor made prior to acquiring it. Um, because we believe that uh, acquisition in good faith may protect the current possessor to some extent. As you may have read in our uh, assessment framework, we do believe that if involuntary uh, dispossession and original ownership are established, then rejection of the claim entirely is not an option anymore. Then something should happen, that is our view. But the acquisition in good faith by the defendant may play a role in the solution. Um, and so, although the restitution committee may, uh, in case of good faith acquisition, decide that the object should be unconditionally returned, the committee may also arrive at a more mediatory solution as long as it can be regarded just and fair, as referred to in principle eight of the Washington principles. And our committee gives examples in the assessment framework. Uh, not, they are not a, they are a limited list, but just examples such as financial compensation instead of restitution or certain requirements regarding accessibility of the work to the public. And now I come to the hard question. Um, can you really say that we eliminated the balancing of interest tests in its entirety, or may it somehow return in cases where the current possessor validly invokes good faith acquisition and ask for a mediatory solution as provided for in point 12 of the assessment framework as proposed by our committee? And our report, I must admit, is silent on this subject. My answer to that question, but it's only my answer because the committee doesn't exist anymore and cannot give an answer, um, my answer would be as follows. Um, the mediatory solution referred to in point 12 must be in accordance with principle 8 of the Washington Principles. And as you all know, principle 8 has been already mentioned several times today, 
um, provides that restitution policy should strive for a just and fair solution, recognizing this may vary according to the facts and circumstances surrounding a specific case. And as J Jacob uh, just pointed out, this wording in itself does not preclude a balancing of interests. Indeed, this wording implies, in my view, that in principle, all facts and circumstances of the case may play a role in deciding whether a solution is just and fair. Not only facts and circumstances as reflected in the factors I just discussed, but any facts and circumstances relevant for this determination. And for example, in my view, uh, the financial position of the applicant or of the current possessor may also play a role in deciding what we, would be a fair and just solution. On the other hand, I would expect that the Restitutions Committee, in applying the assessment framework, would not give great weight to factors that were determined by our committee to be of no service to the purpose of providing redress for the injustices done to victims. Um, as a final point, it should be noted that the number of cases where this question may come up is limited. Obviously, good faith acquisition must be established first. And as Jacob just set out, we recommend that when a state or municipal museum acquired a looted work under circumstances that aren't acceptable under current standards, they should not invoke good faith acquisition at all. And this recommendation may further reduce the number of cases where this question may come up. Um, this is what I wanted to tell you. Thank you for your attention. Mm. And I think I have to give the floor back to Matthias. Thank you very much, uh, Jakob and Rob, for your very intense reports on the report that uh, gives us a lot of points to think about and also to discuss. And uh, when we were organizing this event, we thought it might be the best to start this phase by two formal respondents uh, to what we have just heard. And it is my pleasure to introduce uh, to you and us our first respondent, who is uh, Gertjan van den Berg. Gertjan, it is a pleasure having you here in this uh, session. You are uh, a high profile lawyer in handling uh, cases in our field. I think uh, many of you know you. You are partner with Berg Stop Sanders, if I pronounce it correctly. I apologize for all mistakes in that respect. And uh, we uh, thought that 10 minutes or so should be, must be enough for a first round. I know it's almost impossible, and it is in fact impossible to raise all necessary and important points in such a uh, response. We'll try it. Nevertheless, having in mind a saying that is attributed to Blaise Pascal sometimes, but also to Winston Churchill and to other people. Sorry for being so long. I didn't have the time to be more concise, to make myself more concise. We did the best to make ourselves concise. Maybe 10 or so minutes uh, will be enough for a first round. If there is any remainders, uh, let's take them up in the open discussion after our two responses. Thank you very much. Gert-Jan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Matthias. And uh, thank you, Rheinische Friedrich Wilhelms Universität Bonn, Forschungsstelle Provenienz, Forschung, Kunst und Kulturschutzgerecht. I can assure you that took a week to practice. <coughs> thank you for organizing and hosting this important event. A special thanks for the Center for Research on Dutch Jewry in Jerusalem. As we speak, I'm sitting at our office with a direct view on what used to be the Goudsticker headquarters at Heerengracht, a constant reminder of the importance of our efforts. I will give you some critical notes of my own, and bearing in mind that I have 10 minutes, um, I had to kill a few darlings and try to commit to the German saying, in der Beschränkung zeigt sich der Meister. Let me start by saying that I would like to avoid to sound gloomy. That is certainly not my intention. Jakob Konstam and his colleagues should be applauded for their recommendations. More systemic research, a new and clear unambiguous assessment, less formalistic and more empathic attitude, a partial abandonment of the balance of interest test, a help desk and no termination date of the restitution policy. However, serious concerns remain. 
some of them will be resolved and others won't. Yes, we do need a structured assessment of claims because without, we're left to an exercise of competing sentiments. But we have to face the friction when trying to reconcile absolute property rights with open norms used and sometimes even abused by the museum world. At some point, we seem to have been caught in what I call an Orwellian doublethink. Simultaneously accepting two mutually contradictory beliefs as correct, promoting restitution on the one hand and allowing publicly subsidized museums to hold on to looted artworks in the name of reasonableness. Will we leave this notion of double think with the recommendations of Jakob Konstam and his committee? I fear not entirely. What we need is a better understanding of context. I've had the honor and privilege of speaking with one of the drafters of the Washington Principles, Stuart Eisenstadt. In 2018, he gave an important insight during a conference in Berlin. These principles were written for the despoiled families, not for the museums that try to hold on to stolen paintings. Yet it states that we should take into account facts and circumstances surrounding a specific case. However, this means first and foremost that we need to take into account the unavoidable gaps and ambiguities mentioned in Washington principle number four. Why should we have two separate assessment frameworks for artworks coming from publicly funded museums? We have NK proceedings on the one hand and binding expert opinions on the other. The first one is straightforward, at least at face value, and the second introduces the thorny element of good faith acquisitions. For claimants, it should make no difference. These works are found in publicly funded museums and the assessment should be uniform. If you're fortunate enough to claim a work that is part of the NK collection, then in principle, there are two basic questions, ownership and involuntary loss. This in itself is already enough of a challenge, but the challenges are compounded if the claimed works come from subsidized museums that are not part of the NK collection. The claimant will then have to follow the binding expert opinion in proceedings. Two examples. Bernardo Strozzi's Christ and the Samaritan woman belonging to the Semmel heirs was refused because the heirs were no blood relatives. Beut mit Heuson by Kandinsky belonging to the Lewistein heirs was refused amongst others because the painting was considered too important to the publicly funded Stedelijk Museum. Once you get a negative opinion in the binding expert opinion proceedings, it is very difficult to get an annulment in regular court proceedings. In December last year, the Amsterdam District Court decided it could not redo the work of the restitution committee. And according to the Amsterdam District Court, the decision was not unreasonable. Getting back to the committee is not a given since the Lewistein heirs would need the permission of the Stedelijk Museum and the Amsterdam municipality. The Comsom report is not clear, at least not clear enough uh, where the good faith defense is concerned. On page 29, it is said that today's standards of good faith apply. The introduction of good faith argument in itself is already problematic enough and especially American clients have no understanding for this. To them, the overriding rule is that a thief cannot pass good title. But if we then take a look at the proposed new rule number 10 on page 32, it remarkably enough states that good faith should be judged in accordance with the reality of the time of acquisition, which is opposite of what I just said. Back then, the notions of forced sale, the notions of provenance research and good faith were entirely different from what we accept today. Take the Lewistein case. 
that claim could have been awarded and should have been awarded already because of the fact that the Kandinsky painting was sold to the Stedelijk Museum for the ridiculous amount of 75 euro, back then 160 guilders. Yes, the Kornstam Committee states that the museums should not invoke the good faith arguments, but the new assessment rules do not oblige the Restitution Committee to refuse that defense. Obviously, the museum will plead for a solution that has the least impact, especially if they can't find the funds for a monetary solution. So in fact, we run the risk that the balance of interest test is reintroduced. My point is also that all museums should accept regular proceedings, including private yet publicly subsidized museums and stick to the two basic questions of ownership and involuntary loss. I'm referring to museums such as Singelare, Fundatie in Zwolle, Moor and Voorlinde Museum. That brings me to another flaw in the Dutch restitution practice. The Kornstam Committee argues that the Dutch state had become owner of the NK collection through the passage of time. But the truth of the matter is way more grim. After the war, 10,000 artworks were handed over to the Dutch state by the Allied forces at the Munich collecting points. This was done under the strict condition that the state would act as a custodian and that it would guard the property, not take ownership of it. However, and contrary to the agreement and contrary to international law, the state adopted a set of regulations through which it was established that the works were to become Dutch property once they crossed the Dutch border. For that to happen, the Dutch state stunningly acknowledged Adolf Hitler to be the owner of the works. France, on the other hand, and by law, still considers itself to be custodian of all artworks that return from the collecting points in Munich. This flawed Dutch position has far-reaching consequences. Several disappointed claimants took their grievances to U.S. courts. For instance, the Katz and the Goudstikke heirs started litigation in South Carolina, Los Angeles, and the U.S. judges dismissed their claims, amongst others, on the mistaken view that the Dutch state could claim ownership. Let me finish with one other major concern that, that in my view is insufficiently addressed. In our extensive restitution practice, the one single most common complaint concerns the fact that more than often a strict burden of proof is applied. Our then Minister of Culture, Halbe Selstra, wrote to the Dutch Parliament in June 2012 that we need a quote unquote flexible burden of proof. Practice, however, shows otherwise. Between 2001 and 2020, some 1,620 objects have been claimed. Not more than 36% were granted if we count each object as a separate claim. To a large extent, this is due to the fact that the new interpretation of facts that had already been assessed were not allowed. It was due to a strict burden of proof and more in general, ambiguities uh, are interpreted to the detriment of claimants. There is an impressive list of hardly understandable rejections to prove the points. De Haan, Katz, De Vries, Stern Liebmann, Lewenstein, Königs, Bachstitz, Hamburger, and the list goes on. It might, it might sound strange coming from a lawyer, but when I gave an interview with the New York Times last month in the context of the report we discussed today, my main message was that the process had become too adversary, too judicial, too lawyerly. My point is this, why should the benefit of the doubt be in favor of the museums when claimants plausibly demonstrate their case and it is already established that the work in question has a problematic provenance? We can take an important lesson from the German Beratende Kommission. This week it was decided that the painting Siblings by Eric Heckel should be returned to the heirs of Max Fischer. 
What struck me was the sentence, and I quote, the lack of clarification of the facts should not be to the detriment of the heirs. A clear example of how to properly deal with ambiguities. A few final words. Given the limited time, I need to skip several important topics, such as appeal proceedings and the separation of research and help desk, but hopefully we may discuss those later on during this session. In an interview published in the last newsletter of the Network of European Restitution Committees, the ad interim chairperson of the Restitution Committee stated, we assume that applicants may see a new assessment framework as a reason to submit a new application. It may cautiously be assumed that all cases involving the balance of interest test will need to be reassessed. From a principal point of view, this is hugely important and vital, especially for future reference. However, only a handful of past claims will be impacted. Semmel, Lewistein, and a few others. The vast majority of the rejections involved cases where the evidence presented was deemed insufficient. We may assume that the bulk of the restitution cases is now behind us. There are many frustrated claimants now asking, where does this report leave me in the picture? They try to match the findings of the Kongstam report to their own negative experience and say, okay, according to the committee, this should have been adjudicated differently, more transparent, more empathic, less strict when it comes to evidentiary arguments. To them, it would be a bitter pill to read that their case should have been handled differently, but that nothing will change. It remains to be seen what elements will be adopted. Unfortunately, we do have an example where previous evaluation reports were not fully implemented. I refer to the 2015 Beresholt reports. I'd like to leave you with a news item of last Saturday. The Dutch state plans to create a restitution committee for the return of colonial arts. And guess what? The assessment rules will include a balance of interest test. Mm -hmm. The French have a saying for this. Plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you very much, uh, Gertjan. Very interesting. And I'm sure we'll have a lot to discuss afterwards. Um, I will do a short introduction of my dear friend André Boers as a second respondent. André has been a leader, leader of the Dutch, Dutch Israeli community for many, many years. He is now the chairman of the Center for Research on the History of Dutch uh, for Dutch Jewry. Under André's leadership, the center has taken an active role in the matter of restitution of stolen Jewish properties during the Shoah. Please, André. Thank you very much, Alfred, for your kind introduction. And thank you, Matthias, for this opportunity to join the Bonn University. On the day that Jacob Kohnstam presented the report of the evaluation committee, which he chaired, to the Minister of Culture of the Netherlands, the Center for Research on the History of Dutch Jewry expressed its appreciation in a press release. We praised the empathy and the humane approach of the advice. For the first time since the several Eckhart reports some 20 odd years ago, this is the first time that a governmental committee embraces the position of victims and claimants. We strongly believe that implementation of the advice by the minister will enable the Netherlands to take up its international pioneering role once again. Allow me, ladies and gentlemen, a few observations. To begin with on provenance research. In its report, the evaluation states, and I quote, by subscribing to the Washington principles, the Netherlands has assumed the obligation 
to actively seek out the original owners or their next of kin. Modern technology and the availability of new sources offer fresh perspectives for provenance research in the Netherlands, which contrary to the Washington principles was effectively brought to an end in 2007. The evaluation committee therefore advises that the restitution's expertise center, which forms part of the Netherlands Institute for War, Holocaust and Genocide Studies, the NIOD, should be given the means to resume this structural provenance investigation as soon as possible." Unquote. In our opinion, it would be commendable to consider the establishment of an independent center consisting both of Bureau Herkomstgezocht and the new to establish help desk financially supported by the government and other organizations such as, for example, the Claims Conference. Lest it be forgotten that the NIOD itself expressed as its opinion that possible conflicts of interest should be avoided. Another issue we would like to raise is the matter of some 4,000 art objects auctioned by the Dutch government back in 1915. The committee correctly mentions that insufficient work has been done to make sure the rightful owners or their heirs are restituted their family possessions. If only about 170 requests were lodged, the question should be asked how many applications were rejected out of hand by the restitution committee? Yet another observation. The evaluation committee recommends the minister to review certain decisions of the restitution committee. I would ask for more detailed guidelines and elaborate on what will be considered as NOVA. The decision-making process should be streamlined and rules should be defined. Let us not forget that in the Netherlands and many other countries, national archives are not easily accessible. The law of privacy is often used as an excuse not to enable proper research, which is against principle number two of the Washington Principles. More internationally, as I'm speaking from Israel, allow me also to make a critical remark about my own country. Far too little has been done by Israeli governments during the 72 years since the establishment of the state to search for heirs of Nazi loot at art, which is presently still being held at museums throughout this country. In his intro, Matthias Veller already mentioned that only five out of the 44 countries subscribing to the Washington principles do have restitution committees, and Israel is not one of them. Law giving is of the essence, and it would be commendable, in my opinion, to set up a restitution committee in Israel as well. And finally, there is on the international scene a major problem for claimants who do not have the financial means to obtain legal assistance. Gert Jan mentioned this in his response. In many countries, including the Netherlands, there is no system of no cure, no pay. Hence it should be considered to establish a worldwide fund to assist claimants in their efforts to repossess what was taken from them under duress were stolen and looted from their relatives. Striving for justice, in the words of Psalm 82, verse 3, means shiftu dal v'yatom anivarash hatzdiku. Defend the cause of the weak and the orphan. Maintain the rights of the poor and the oppressed. Thank you.
Thank you very much, André, for another very intense and thoughtful and uh, meaningful response. And uh, we are now, I believe, perfectly prepared for entering the phase of Q and A. And let me explain how this uh, will work. Um, you will see a Q and A window at the bottom of your page where you can type in questions. Uh, some of you have already started typing in questions. This is uh, exactly the way you should now uh, intervene if you like um, to intervene. Uh, at the same time, we uh, requested uh, sending in questions uh, in advance. We received quite a number of uh, questions uh, from outside, so to speak. And uh, we, the moderators, uh, Tessa, Alfred, and myself, we will do our best to collect, frame, and present these questions uh, to the audience and uh, suggest uh, some or one of the panelists uh, to start answering. And uh, we are very much looking forward to this uh, interactive part of our session. And uh, I hand over to you, uh, Alfred, to go into the first round. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthias. Um, it's pretty clear that balance of interest is the main, or one of the main points of our discussion tonight. We heard the view of Rokolak and Gertjan van der Berg on the subject. Um, maybe to first with Jacob and then with Rob and then with uh, Gerdian, maybe we try to pinpoint it. Uh, do you share the view of Stuart Eisenstadt that the balance of interest test is not in line with the natural processing principles, especially if the processor acquired the painting directly during World War II? This is a very Limited case, but let's start with this one. Jacob. Well, um, uh, difficult to contradict someone who was at the basis of the Washington principles. But anyway, if you look at principle eight, and it has been expressed moreover by Tessa, by Matthias, by Rob, and by myself, if you look at that text, then balance of interest is allowed for. Although, we as commission think that taking the regulation of the, of the restitutions committee in the Netherlands with a couple of points in there that Rob went through uh, in his speech, we think that most of them are invalid to be used as a balance of interest. And specifically, what I find very interesting is our talks with directors of museum who really said that the importance of the art of the work for the museum wasn't something to be taken into account. And that's why we sort of, if you want, compromised and said, yes, the balance of interest in any you, uh, 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 um, law-like or traditional sort of decision should be taken into account in, in not in, in the NK cases, it's different than in the other cases, but that in effect, the importance of the museum to keep that work. All directors just said very clear to us, we don't want that work to be in our midst. And in fact, I can say to you that after the commission has been uh, re dissolved because we're not yet anymore a commission, there are a couple of the directors of museums that, that, that came to me and, and are still rethinking what should we do with it and, and, and try to follow the line that we gave to, and that to, to repeat that. Uh, good faith is something that you could, can invoke, but we really pushed municipal and, and state musea not to say in the balance of interest that the, uh, uh, that, that the uh, good faith argument should be um, uh, involved and and so I think that this discussion will probably not be as important as it was in the last couple of years if our if our advice is followed by the minister. Thank you very much, please, Rob. Yeah, I do not have much to add to what uh, Jacob said, so I'm not going to repeat that. 
Um, I think with regard to it, the in, invoking the good faith defense, um, uh, uh, Gert Jan van der Berg also made some remarks about that. We do indeed take a somewhat subtle position because in our um, framework where, that we advise to the minister and to the Dutch government to adopt, um, we, we say a, 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 a possessor can invoke a good faith acquisition and it may be a defense to some extent. Um, but we also recommend, but it's not in the assessment framework, to the state as a owner or possessor of works, we say we believe that you would act wisely not to invoke that defense if the circumstances under which you have obtained the work would not be acceptable if you apply the standards of today. It's a sort of recommendation to act and to give an example. Uh, but there is, so we do give a sort of double, double uh, position there to the government, the government as rule maker for the uh, society as a whole and the government as owner slash possessor of works. And so that may be somewhat confusing, but I think, I think we have written it down correctly, but I understand that there may be some confusion about what we exactly mean there. So I hope I've clarified that now. Thank you. Gert, Gert Jan? Yeah, thank you, Alfred. Um, I attended a conference in uh, Berlin in November 2018 uh, when Stuart Eisenstadt, uh, who is one of the drafters of uh, the Washington Principle, uh, Principles, very clearly said there is no place for a balance of interest test in case of Nazi looted art. The basic questions that need to be addressed are twofold, ownership and involuntary loss. Um, we now have two separate assessment rules uh, and that is very hard to um, explain um, uh, to clients and to claimants um, uh, when these works all come from public collections. Uh, if you happen to claim an NK work, the only two questions that apply regard ownership and involuntary loss. If the work also coming from a public collection is not NK, then you run the risk of entering into mediatory solutions due to the question whether or not the museum acquired work in good faith. Um, what should be applauded is uh, that uh, the Konstam uh, committee got rid of 80% of the binding, uh, sorry, of um, uh, the balance of interest test. Elements that are now um, disregarded uh, questions uh, such as the significance of the uh, work to the applicant, the significance of the work to the owner, the significance of the work uh, to the public art collections, and the endeavors um, that were shown uh, after the war in retrieving the work. Um, however, the good faith element is still there. Good faith is nowhere mentioned in the Washington Principles. Good faith is nowhere mentioned in the Terezin Declaration. It's not part of the initial Eckert Principles. It's not part of the assessment in Austria. It's not part of the assessment in France. In the US, the good faith purchaser has to bear the burden of proving that the work was not stolen. Uh, that is the famous Bacalar Vavra um, uh, case. Um, so uh, it was, in my opinion, much easier to go back to the simple core question that should be asked, show plausible cause for ownership and show plausible cause for involuntary loss. And that's it. Well, for Jacob, would you like to react to that again? Second reaction? Um, fierce critics from a Dutch guy over there, the German would say, was ich lieb, das neckt sich dann. But, 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 uh, and, and, and what I hear uh, Jan saying, um, um, you see, I think that if you look at the NK collection, uh, the involuntary loss um, 
is something that is so obviously every museum uh, gets uh, buys or, or whatever gets a, a, an artwork that is on the list of the NK collection, even if the, and, and, and that museum haven't looked at the list of the NK collection, then it's no good faith. So good faith and NK doesn't go together anyway, because it's an open uh, database that you can look at and see whatever has been given back from the allies to uh, the Dutch uh, in order, custodian, in order to give it back to, uh, to those who, who owned it before. But it's quite a difference. And I, 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 I really think that if you look at good faith, the Dutch situation, I mean, um, the Washington principles haven't looked at the Dutch uh, 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 situation in the sense of our legal situation, like, like Tessa explained, uh, in, in Europe, it's, or in, in continental Europe at least, it is different than from other um, uh, jurisdictions. But we really think that we need to oblige everyone who was buying art to be aware of the fact that that art might be stolen art from Jews out the Second World War and be aware of that. In the 50s and the 60s, that wasn't something that people were aware of. If you look back to that area now with the knowledge that we have and with the moral sort of feeling that we have and, and passion that we have, we just don't understand how Jews were, were, were accepted back to the, to the country if they survived the war at all. And, and, and no one wanted to look at restitution policy or nearly no one wanted to look. There's quite a difference now and then. So I really think that NK collection and the other collection should be separated in several ways. Um, that the provenance research now is much more sophisticated than it ever has been before. Um, so so uh, I, think, I still think that it's quite reasonable. And what I hear Ted Young uh, from the Bear saying about his client, um, and that's very understandable. I've been a lawyer before entering into politics. I want to win this case. Yes, sure, you want to win that case, but that's not the only one. As you look at restitution policy, there is some sort of, yeah, balance that you need in 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 a policy way, and not only saying, uh, "I want to win this case." I would want to win this case anyway, but not in the way you exposed it. Thank you. I want to get in, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and, and maybe a few points. Um, um, there is also a, a policy reason for maintaining the good faith uh, defense. Um, we have discussed this. If you would really, really drop that at all, it would also mean that museums and uh, on the market now would not have any reason to do any research in the provenance of what they buy, because they know whatever we do, it doesn't make a difference. If a claim comes up, we'll lose it anyway. So it's also, there is also a, a, so to speak, a moral reason to maintain the good faith defense to some extent. And I mean, it is part of Dutch law and culture. The fact that things are different in the US does not really convince me. There are more things different in the US that I wouldn't want to adopt in the Netherlands. Um, and indeed, as Jacob has set out, set out um, there is a historic difference between the NK collection and the other uh, works, uh, um, the other works that are potentially claimed. And that historic difference does explain why there is a difference in treatment. And indeed, it makes it more complicated. I, I admit that. But sometimes some type, some complexity is needed to achieve a just and fair solution, I would think. Thank you. Uh, Tessa, I, I, by the way, I would suggest that, you know, we talked a lot about the balance of interest and good faith. I'm sure there are a lot of other items and I see the questions which come up. So maybe we'll go to the other questions also. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, <clears throat> Um Another question to our keynote speakers comes from the auditorium and it refers to the different assessment between private persons and art dealers which is, um, if I may add, a unique practice in, um, of the Dutch commission uh, com in comparison to the other commissions. 
So the questions to Jacob and Rob are, what exactly are the different approaches and why has the Evolu um, Evolution Commission decided to maintain this uh, differentiations? Thank you. Let, let, let me start and, and give over to Rob if he, he, he thinks that uh, he's better uh, off in, in answering these questions. There's two points. The first one is, as far as I can think, um, the difference between um, the, the, the specific position uh, for the art dealers is also in the Eckhart um, uh, report um, uh, to start with. So it's not something that we sort of uh, thought of uh, <laughs> last minute in the Evaluation Commission. You see, the difference is very simple. An art dealer deals with art. The art that is in his office sometimes is his property, but mostly isn't. And because he is selling art, because that's his business, there is a difference between a private person and, and an art seller. Um, and and that, that you, you, let me quote the, the, the fifth point in the assessment framework to make sure that it isn't, um, that we, that we that we don't look at art sellers in, in the same way, in nearly the same way. And if the original owner is an art dealer who belonged to a persecuted population group, involuntary dispossession will be assumed if there are sufficiently plausible indications of involuntary dispossessions. And then comes a couple of examples. Because if your business is selling art, um, you, you have, it, it is more complicated than, than in, a, than in a, a private situation. And of course, because of the Nazi regime, if a art dealer sold art because he was obliged to do so, because then he could get maybe a passport to get to the United States or whatever, um, then it's involuntary and then it's within the restitution policy, it should be handled the same thing. But the, the, the first point is there's simply a difference between the art seller and the private owner of a of a art work. But maybe Rob, what do? Yeah, no, I think the only uh, I hear somebody is uh, ringing this church bells. Church bells. It's not here anyway. Um, um, no, the only one point to add, actually, I think the difference between, uh, um, in particular, Jewish individuals and Jewish art dealers, the difference will diminish in the course of the Second World War. So at the beginning of the World War, I think that distinction is, is, is fair, in the sense that, as uh, Jacob set out, if a dealer sells in 1940, yeah, that's part of his business, and you cannot assume it's involuntary. involuntary. While if it's a Jewish individual, you may assume that. Uh, as and if the after the war progressed, I think that distinction becomes less convincing. But I think the examples we give also make that clear. Uh, we have discussed the possibility of of, of creating a sort of a, a point in time after which the distinction would be dropped. But it's it's very um, it's very hard to find a point in time that's not arbitrary. So we decided this is up to the restitutions committee to to decide where the distinction loses um, uh, uh, force and where it's easier to assume that a sale also by our dealer is involuntary. Thank you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Tessa. I apologize for the church bells that come from the Catholic area of Bonn. Just ignore them. It won't be for long, but I cannot reach the window from here. So uh, let's just ignore the noises in the background. Uh, it is my pleasure to take up two questions that are, relate a little bit to uh, my person. So I take the liberty to answer these questions, but I will help. Uh, I will need the help of our Dutch experts uh, in a second part of uh, one of these questions. 
Uh, we received uh, thanks to us to organize this event in Germany. That was uh, a nice um, uh, message, I thank you very much. But the message was combined with the question why it did not take place in the Netherlands. Uh, and that was um, seen as a bit um, uh, of a point of critique. Um, let me answer uh, in the following way. I believe we do speak about a very German topic here, and uh, it is always the right place, one right place, to discuss our matters in Germany and from Germany uh, with uh, an international audience. I uh, interpret it as a generosity and a sign of friendship uh, to get the positive responses to our invitations to have this first event on the Kunstam report from our platform. And I'm absolutely convinced that the, conv that the discussion will be uh, going on in the Netherlands. Uh, I am in contact with fantastic researchers in the Netherlands who are writing their PhDs on the topic. There is a vivid audience. Uh, many of them are in this video room. So the discussion will go on and forgive me for being so uh, quick to approach our panelists uh, that the first of many events uh, is taking place somehow from Germany. After all, it's a virtual place we are meeting. It's not so much German. The next question relates to the issue of the ownership question of the NK collection. And again, there is critique that is raised. Uh, maybe we can go uh, some more into this uh, topic. Why? the Dutch state considers itself as an owner. This is, as we heard from Tessa, uh, linked to a kind of symbolic uh, sign that is uh, considered to be not appropriate. So maybe we can hear about the reasons why this is uh, seen in that way and uh, how we can evaluate them. Thank you for that. Another point uh, before I hand over to our uh, Dutch experts on that, relates to the restatement project. And um, allow me to take this up uh, before we hand over to you, because the question was, uh, how is your project going in restating the Washington principles? This is a misunderstanding. We are not intending to restating the Washington principles, not at all. On the contrary, our project is the attempt to further implement the Washington principles and the spirit of the Washington principles to go deeper into the practice and to understand it better. One last remark uh, on another question by another interventionist that relates to my interpretation of the recommendation of the 2nd of July 2020 in the Hagen case. The intervention is the critique is that there was no balancing of interests in this case. Uh, I agree to the extent that that was not the wording that the Commission used, but uh, if we look at the functional approach of the Commission, I would very much like to continue saying that there was a weighing of interest on a moral level in place. Uh, had that not, not been taken place, uh, the case would have been lost on a kind of legal evaluation, as it is spelled out by uh, the Commission uh, itself. And the uh, museum's interest in keeping the object was not taken into account in the sense that it was very small. It was mentioned in the reasoning. That's my interpretation of the Commission, but I'm very happy to take that up at a later moment outside um, this session. Now, now I hand over to our Dutch uh, specialists on the question, uh, who is really or should be the owner of the objects held in the NK collection? Thank you very much. Well, I will gladly ask Rob to uh, answer that question, but let me say about the commission as such, that we had a fierce discussion on this point. The, the, the lawyers in the commission all came to the conclusion, if you look to the Dutch legislation, it's ownership. And the non-lawyers in the commission always said, it's custodian, and we wanted to give it back. So I was very happy about Tessa's formulation that it has a symbolic 
more the symbolic situation because we think as commission, all of them, the lawyers and the non-lawyers in the commission, that the aim should be that the Dutch government does its utmost 150% investment in finding and, 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 and doing the provenance research and finding uh, the, the heirs and see whether we could restitute a lot of that art as much as possible. But Rob, maybe you can explain why um, we as lawyers decided finally it's, uh, 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 it's, it's uh, property, it's ownership. Yeah. Yeah, I, I will briefly explain without going into too much uh, legal detail. Uh, I think the, the, the basic reason for this is that the Dutch states, um, after the war, as Gert Jan uh, um, explained, regarded itself as owner. Um, so they started acting as what in Dutch is called bezitter, and you could translate as possessor. Um, and uh, there was a change made in the law in 1992. The new civil code was introduced. And that contains a rule saying that if the a claim uh, by a, a former owner or by an owner to uh, to get property back from a possessor, if that claim is barred by time, is time barred for yards in Dutch, then the possessor becomes owner. Um, that's a rule. That's a rule that has been greatly criticized, also by me, by the way. Uh, but it is a rule that the civil code clearly sets forward. So if we now look at the situation of the uh, NK collection, uh, the Dutch state started to regard itself as owner, while you may argue they weren't in 1945, but they started acting as an owner. And the possibility to reclaim uh, since then uh, has been a statute barred for a very long time. I will not go into detail, but it has. And in, when the new civil code was introduced, it wa was already st uh, statute barred in 1992 when the new civil code was introduced. And the new civil code said uh, that the transitory rules of the new civil code simply said, if you are in that situation and if we are introduced, then you have another year to claim. And if you don't claim, so as of the 1st of January 1993, every possessor, even in bad faith, even if that possessor knows he or she is not the owner, if there has been not a claim, then that possessor becomes the owner. And that rule, in our view, also applies to the Dutch state with regard to the NK collection. So it's a very technical reason that we say that we do understand that there is a symbolic and a moral reason to, to, to make notes around that notion. Uh, and not to accept that uh, in its entirety. So that's also why uh, Jacob has said uh, there is a moral obligation on the state and they must make a 150% effort to try to give back what belongs to uh, the original owners. But from a, just a technical point of view, they are the owner at this moment. That doesn't mean they have been the owner as of 1945. They have become the owner, in our view, as of the 1st of January, 1993. Thank you. Um, next round of questions. I have a question here regarding a, the help desk, uh, which is recommended by the commission. Um, the question is, who is will be responsible for the help desk and who will be responsible for Herkom's result? Um, who also, what maybe you could explain a little bit better, the exact difference between help desk and herkomst gezocht. In the end of the day, both need to find out in a proactive way who the heirs are of the NK collection. And in the, so they have to do all the efforts in order to find the heirs of all these paintings. Why wouldn't it be possible, as you hear, to put them together? And under the, as Andre mentioned, under the responsibility of the government, the um, RCE, instead of putting them under the authority of the NEOT, which has a task as, um, uh, as researchers, and not as proactive finding the heirs. 
Jacob? Well, we think that there's a triangle in restitution organization. Finally, there's the Restitutions Commission, but there's also plain research done and dealt with. Um, uh, provenance, when and where were artworks sold, by whom, um, and why? That's, that's, I'm not sure whether that's definition, but that's what I understand from provenance is, is that part. And you need very specialized people who for the time being now are all situated into the NEOLD, which then would be the second part of the triangle research, but the most important to start with proactive organization that indeed should fall under the responsibility of the Minister, Minister of Culture in our view, because it's so important to spread the news about the restitution policy in the Netherlands, to help people to find their way, what to do and where to do. And we want, we want the minister to be responsible for that so that in the second chamber, in politics, you can say to the minister, my God, why didn't you, why, why aren't you activating, why aren't you active in that respect? That's, that's sort of um, part of what, 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 by the way, was dealt with before, before Herkomt was off, but I, I, we think that there's this triangle, the activist proactive office that tries to find people, that tries to answer questions from everywhere uh, who comes with questions on restitution. Finally, restitutions committee where there is a request for restitution and then separated, there's a serious, very well involved uh, academic research center uh, under the knee of that can, that can then take care of that, that research. That's, that's about this triangle idea that we uh, that we uh, we have. Andre, would you like to add something? No, I don't think that there's anything I should add to that. Okay. I, I Maybe the one question again for Jacob: um, How would you feel about involvement of NGO organizations or Jewish organizations like the Claim Conference, who was already involved with Herkomstgesocht in this project of the help desk? Um, no, I, I, I have to think about it, but, but I think that I would be positive about sort of working together at least, uh, knowing each other, finding each other, um, uh, knowing the persons, which is not within organizations, you can, you can know the organization, but it's, it's easier in this kind of emotional business um, to, to know each other, just to pick up the phone and, and, and be there. Um, uh, the, 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 I, I really think that working together also as far as the, the new uh, uh, help desk, active help desk, we, we think that we've chosen a wrong word. Help desk is something passive, but we have very much in mind the proactive uh, help desk who goes out itself. Also working together with the foreign ministry, um, some looted art in Poland in discussion, we all know about it. And, and, and couldn't the ministry, the foreign ministry do some, be some more active? Well, things like that. And then I think the center could work very well help um, uh, uh, in, in order to, to make this function as optimal as possible. Thank you. Tessa? Um, another question relates directly to a statement in the Kunstam report. And there it is stated that the Dutch Restitution Commission would rather abandon the um, binding opinion procedure. So the question is, what, is the, what was the motivation of the Dutch Restitution Commission? Maybe um, also to our uh, keynote speakers. Um. We, we, we um, the restitution committee um, did 
advise us or ask us to abandon the to 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 to, to have the restitution commission an advisory board more than a decisive board. I think that's maybe the best non-legal uh, wording of, 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 the, of the problem. Um, because of the, the idea, which Gert Jan also mentioned in his introduction, that the feeling is that there's, um, that it is too, um, that, that it's too um, administrative, and legalistically taken into uh, the procedure and that the procedure should maybe be more looking for solutions instead of getting lawyers um, uh, at work, so to say. <laughs> I'm a lawyer and I don't mind working, but it, it's just that, that there is a problem and try to solve the problem. If you're an advisory committee, then you can talk with one party and then talk with the other party and, and, and see whether you can get the middle, get a solution that is acceptable for both parties, so to say, which is, which is a good idea. But in the end, we want that there is a decisive organization that can decide, well, we have heard very well what you've done, but this is the decision. It's so hard. I mean, um, if you disagree with the Restitutions Committee in a binding uh, advice, like it's called, um, you, you have signed for doing accordingly what the Restitutions Committee said. I wouldn't like a museum in the end to say to the restitution committee who only has an advisory role, say, well, it's an interesting advice, but we're gonna go and find some others to, to give another advice. I mean, would claimants be helped by that if there isn't a binding position of the restitutions committee? I'm not sure how you would state that that it's maybe may a very wrong expression, but in 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 Dutch you would say "bill market court." Don't don't have it endlessly not clear what the that what what the advisor what the decision is. So there we decided to ask a, an advice of a very well informed lawyer uh, working for the Dutch Supreme Court whether within the binding um, uh, decisions of the, of the Restitution Committee, there could be more, could be less legalistic approach. And, and we have put into our report a couple of suggestions how to deal with that so that it becomes more human and less legal uh, a procedure with the, with the Restitution Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm counting 50 questions ahead of us. And if I counted correctly, we dealt with maybe 10 at best. So that's where we are standing. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, um, information wise, I am picking up one of these 50 questions, which is very precise and raises a very uh, important point that relates to Rob's presentation. And uh, Rob, the question is, that um, uh, about the role of the financial position of the claimants or the holding museum. Uh, I think you mentioned that as part uh, of the picture and uh, the question seems to be, what exactly are you imagining, uh, are you imagining with uh, these um, uh, words or with this wording? Well, um... Uh, again, this is totally my view, and you cannot um, you cannot attribute it to the committee or to anyone else than me. Uh, what I meant was, uh, I mean, we, we have to take an example to explain this. If the restitution committee would have a case where the uh, there is good faith, where it's established that the possessor acquired the object in good faith, otherwise we don't have this discussion. Um, and it's clear that the purpose of the um, uh, of the plaintiff is to uh, obtain financial compensation rather 
than to get to uh, work back. And it's clear that that is an urgent matter for the plaintiff for one reason or another. Uh, in view of the financial position of the plaintiff, that may play a role in the kind of decision, in my view, that the committee takes. And on the other hand, if 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 um, uh, the museum, the good faith possessor museum, would be bankrupted by financial compensation rather than by just giving back the painting, that may be a reason for the committee to say, um, give the painting back and then it's up to the plaintiff if the plaintiff uh, is looking for money to sell it. But we are not going to say that the museum has to pay a sum of money because by that decision, we will bankrupt the museum. So that's, that's what I mean to give you some examples that the financial position of the parties may play a role in the, in the structure of the decision by the restitutions committee. And that may be, and those may be factors that in itself have nothing to do with the uh, Second World War. Thank you, Rob. Thank you. you, Alfred. Yeah, um, very quickly. Um, what we then will see happen is that museums uh, will opt for the most easy way out. There are no funds to compensate um, uh, claimants, uh, or at least um, uh, there is no immediate possibility um, uh, to fund uh, payment of uh, uh, claimants. So um, what we will see happening is um, that museums will pay, will uh, play the poor me card. Um, uh, let's put a plaque next to the painting, explain how the despoiled family lost possession of uh, the painting and leave it at that. So I find that I find the suggestion rather problematic, especially if we do not know how alternative solutions will be funded. May I respond to that? Sure. So, I mean that, yeah, uh, to be honest, uh, Gert Jan, you, you regard, you look at everything from the plaintiff's perspective um, and, and, you, and your confidence in the museum is, is obviously not very big. Um, but we try to, or we try to look for uh, frameworks that also take into account the position of, um, of, of other parties. And I wouldn't see why this it, a museum would play a, a beggar's role. Why? Well, if they would, the restitutions committee can say we want to see your your financial statements. I mean that, that this is what parties also can do in normal legal proceedings. And then if you have a critical committee, they will look whether there is room for another solution. So I I don't see why flexibility in this respect would also would always work out in favor of the museums. It could also work out in favor of the plaintiffs. And, and may I add just one remark that having spoken to several directors of museums and having witnessed this, that the restitution policy and the moral pressure to restitute is becoming um, stronger the farther we got from the Second World War time, that there is remembrance is something that is so... Um, um, expressed nowadays, I don't think, gert -Jan, that these um, uh, rotten directors of museum do really care about um, keeping the art and not responding to the moral um, uh, question. Listen, if it's stolen art and if there's a property, give it back, don't go for good faith, but give it back. And I, the, the discussions that I have had also after um, publishing the report, uh, I'm, I'm very confident that uh, the time that the museum director could easily say in public, I don't care about that it is, that it is looted art, I wanna keep it. They will have a very difficult time in public. And, and in the discussion. And they had easier times before, but it is over. Very short, uh, Very shortly. Um, uh, Jacob, with all due respect, I do not agree. I remember the director of the Bonifante Museum uh, after 202 works were given back to the Houtstekker heirs, say on record, uh, this should not become the norm. Uh, these works are part of a public collection. 
The other thing is, uh, I have noticed... Sorry, Gert Jan, that's the Goudstikker case. That was how long ago? Yeah, that was long ago. I know. I, I know. That, but nevertheless, I mean, this was a museum director on record saying this should not become uh, the norm. And there is also a, a, a certain level of hypocrisy from the museum uh, world in the sense that publicly um, they promote the uh, uh, serving of justice, whilst at the same time in binding uh, opinion uh, proceedings during uh, the oral uh, sessions, uh, emphasizing how important these works are to their collection. So what they say publicly it totally contradicts uh, what they say during our oral hearings. Okay, thank you, really. Um, uh, we have a couple of minutes, uh, Matthias, till uh, eight o'clock at your and nine o'clock here. We said two hours. Would you like to do another round or would you like to wrap it up? There are still 50 questions. We <laughs> handled a few of them, but there were some new questions. I'm happy to stay here as long as you are happy to stay here. And there are so important questions uh, in uh, the chat in uh, on our sheets. Uh, let's do at least one more round. And uh, I would, uh, I think it is Tessa's um, at, uh, slot. Is that right for the next round of questions? I, I lost. I lost track. No, I think it's my slot. So it's, I it's want yours. To, it's yours. Please go. I want ahead. to do a very. I, I picked up a question here which I liked. The Netherlands is leading among the OECD countries in offering international aid to other countries, a share of its GDP. What would it take for the Netherlands to lead by example the international process? of restitution of Holocaust arts. In other words, what should happen for the Netherlands to lead that process? The Netherlands is leading in offering international aid, aid to other countries as share of its GDP. As a former politician, Jacob. Yes, that's exactly why I left politics, not being <laughs> obliged to answer all difficult questions. <laughs> um, uh, the, um, well, the, the, it's, it's, I'm not quite sure. I, I wouldn't be able to answer it out of like this. Sure, but that, like an idea, as, as, as an idea. I, 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 well, <laughs> the most easy answer is if the Minister of Culture follows our advices, then we're leading in uh, restitution. Uh, uh, the politics again like we were before I think 10, 10 15 years ago uh, that's my firm belief whether there should be a, a comparison with uh, um, the the aid I'm, I'm not sure I don't think so um, so I'm sorry I, I, I don't have a serious answer to this by the way serious but just as a thought then yeah. thank you Tessa Okay, um, another question is, um, will the new assessment have retroactive effect and can we expect renewed claims? That, that's a question of retroactivity, isn't it? I think we touched upon in our, our yes. speeches until now. Uh, it, it, uh, it very much depends um, like I said, new policy generally only goes forward and not backwards, has no retroactive uh, um, uh, method, uh, uh, force. Um, but I stated today, uh, not being uh, chair of the commission anymore, this be, be a little more free in what, I've, what I think and say, that as far as the importance of the work for the museum as um, uh, the balance of interest element, we really want to skip that. Um, and if you take that, that the, the, the balance of interest has only been taken into account by the Restitutions Committee for three or four cases, and I think that as far as I am concerned, I would advise the Minister to give our advice a retroactive force so that also uh, claimants could go back to the restitution committee, which wouldn't say, by the way, uh, 
that these cases will always decide, will always be have as a result restitution, because then the two main questions still remain: um, uh, is there involuntary loss, and, and is there ownership? And, and these cases always have a sort of discussion in that sense as well. So I think retroact, yes, but but don't think that then by then uh, uh, these cases will lead to um, uh, restitution. It might, but it might also not. And maybe a final remark as far as I'm concerned. Um, and until in the questions, until now in the questions, we didn't went went into it went into individual cases. We were very much looking to the policy point and not to individual cases. And of course, we looked at individual cases to see what the effect of the policy was. But we, I, I wouldn't ever in public say as chair of that committee, uh, what I think about a specific case, because that's the Restitutions Committee business. And we were only looking or only looking at the restitution policy of the Dutch government, which which was, well, that's was our focus. Thank you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Comment from my list of uh, interventions and one precise question. The comment relates to the role of good faith and the comment relates to uh, the claimants in the Bauer case in France who apparently uh, consider raising the European Convention of Human Rights uh, defenses uh, for the reason that uh, the good faith um, uh, position is not uh, regarded uh, as it stands right now in the case in France. That may be one example to illustrate how complicated policy matters may be if they cross the Atlantic and go back. The question uh, relates to another point that we briefly uh, touched upon, but we, I believe, did not really get into it. And these are post-war compensation schemes. Uh, there is, of course, reference to post-war behavior as such in the Kornstam report, but maybe we can go a little bit um, uh, more precisely towards the issue of post-war compensation. What is the evaluation of any such uh, compensation schemes, uh, if at all, in the view of the committee. I think these, uh, or this question goes to, as most of the questions, to our keynote speakers. And so I would like to invite uh, Jakob and then Rob to maybe comment on that. Thank you. Within the restitution policy, I don't think it plays a big role, does it? Or haven't I looked good enough at it in the last year? So I think it's, it's a good question, um, but you need other keynote speakers, though not, not those who, who concentrated on restitution policy uh, to, to give an answer to that question. Rob, is, is there anything that I haven't seen or yeah. I think it's, it's an issue that we, in our uh, assessment framework, just doesn't play a role. So we haven't uh, dealt... Just as a matter of comparison, it's one of the few the things that we can find in our so short Handreichung or manual. Uh, if there was a compensation in the post-war compensation schemes, that might exclude uh, the restitution, but uh, it is not handled that way in practice. That is uh, the picture once more in Germany. Maybe it is another sign that we do need some sort of assessment of the policy in Germany and maybe one day some sort of a Kunstam report in our country as well. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, we are another round or shall we? And, uh, I think we have more than two hours now. and. Uh, we have really talked about the most important part and I just would like to make some conclusion remarks uh, to the session and we might think of other possibilities to continue with the, I see here 60 questions we have already here. Maybe we'll find a solution for that. We now come to an end of this uh, unique webinar Zoom conference. Unique because of one, 
the fabulous cooperation between an academic institution and an NGO. And I think you will have seen it also from the sort of questions we got. Not all of them were really academic questions. Obviously, there is a distinct difference between the mission and vision of the university and the center. At no time, this has given even the slightest problem in preparing the Zoom. We started thinking about this webinar on a cold, dark winter evening, Matthias and me, on the 15th of December in Bonn. That means less than uh, two months ago. Matthias, you really never look back and the results are amazing. Thank you for your dedication, passion, and amazing organization with your staff of this venture. It is also unique because almost 400 professionals involved with the restitution business are participating. So big is the interest, we were really um, dumbfounded by the number of people who participated tonight. And unique also because of the very pleasant and good humored atmosphere. Yes, we even had a laugh now and then between the keynote speakers, the panelists, and the staff of the university and the center. The center will prepare a note for Minister von Engelshoven, who is responsible for the restitution policy, reporting on this highly important webinar. Let me take the liberty to quote from the Konstam report. No matter how great the symbolic and emotional value of the objects that were looted, this value pales into a snip in significance when placed alongside the scale of that historical crime. Nevertheless, for many of the relatives, those objects are all that remains. All this means that restitution policy is a highly charged subject. At the same time, the situation is further complicated by the fact that not only the emotional and historical significance of this cultural object appears to have increased over time, but also their monetary value. Restitution for me is a quest for justice. Justice for my family, justice for all the other families who were completely destroyed during the Holocaust. And it is more. It is tikkun olam, the repair of the world, the healing of the world, making the world a better place. As an Orthodox Jew, I pray for Tikkun Olam three times a day. I am sure all of us who are involved with restitution have the wish of Tikkun Olam in their hearts. Thank you all for being here. Thanks for your patience and thanks for your involvement. Thank yes. you very much indeed, Alfred for your closing remarks and uh, thank you and the center for co-moderating and co-hosting this event so perfectly and in such a good spirit. My sincere thanks to all panelists and attendees. The repair of the world, the healing of the world, making the world a better place. Yes, this is the dream we have coming from all different kinds of backgrounds and we will pursue to it, hopefully together with you towards an ever better future. Allow me one last special thanks to my team here in Bonn, who did not only organize and supervise this video event technically, which is an adventure of its own kind, but who are extremely dedicated in the research on our topic. And if I can say one thing for sure, this team is striving for justice like all of us tonight. Thank you very much. Stay safe. Goodbye and see you soon again.